This week we is going to be looking at the proximal femur. Oh, why only the proximal femur, you say? Well, a um, couple of reasons. I had a question on the lesser trochanter in a recent exam and students didn't do very well at it, so I thought I'd spend time reviewing it, revising it. And also the proximal femur is a hip thing, whereas the distal femur is a knee thing, and we looked at the knee a few months ago. We even looked at the patella in detail. Um, so I thought that if we focus on just the proximal femur, we can focus on the important bits, and then I can like I can bring it all together so it's super simple. You guys get it super nailed, and it's gonna be super easy, right? Also, it's the longest bone in the body, so I think we're allowed to break it up, right? Um, the femur is a little bit like the humerus in that it's the other big ball and socket joint. Got a big ball and socket joint at the gleno, uh, glenohumeral joint. I was teaching shoulder this week. Anyway, glenohumeral joint. Um, we've got this nice deep ball and socket joint at the hip and the femur's forming the socket of it. But also in the humerus, we see a couple of tubercles, the greater and lesser tubercles. And when we look at the femur, we also see a couple of trochanters, which are the same idea. And knowing where these lumpy bony bits are and the groups of muscles that attach to them, we can then see how those muscles move the femur and why the femur is shaped as it is. Mechanical advantage, leverage, stuff like that. All right? Now, this isn't a terribly detailed femur, actually. I've got a better one on, on uh, this friend. Um, but there are, you know, if you look in the textbooks and the analysis, you'll see a huge amount of detail here, and I mentioned some of that detail, but the main aim here is to look at the big bits, all right? Okay then, so if we start at the proximal, most proximal bit here, this is the, the head of the femur and this is the neck. Now if we look at this in situ, we can see that the, the head of the femur is the ball of the ball and socket and the socket is the acetabulum of the pelvis, and the acetabulum is made up of the three bones of the, of the pelvis, right? So that's our ball and socket joint. Now it's quite a deep ball and socket joint, which means it's quite a strong joint, unlike the shoulder girdle, which is, or the shoulder, the glenohumeral joint, which is a little bit weaker, it's, it's more open. Um, but this is, you know, the reason the femur is such a big bone, the reason this joint is such a big chunky joint, is because of course it's taking our entire body weight. Um, but there are a range of movements here that the ball and socket joint allows, which we should review before we talk about how all this moves, right? Um, so, we've got, abduction of the femur at the hip joint and we've got adduction uh, of the femur or the thigh and we've got flexion of the hip joint and we've got extension of the hip joint so that's flexion and extension but then we've also got medial rotation ooh, <laughs> medial rotation and lateral rotation right so me me he's a bit limited because he's got spiky bits but medial rotation and lateral rotation medial rotation and lateral rotation of the femur so these bony bits on the proximal part of the femur are enabling all of that and of course we've got other big muscles doing it as well medial rotation lateral rotation medial rotation lateral rotation oh, hurt my hip flexors and my uh, bits of my lateral rotators bouldering last week they're getting better, but um, ooh, still feel a bit of. And then, of course, we've got circumduction. But, but, got like circumduction. Now, so it's a nice, it's, it's, a, it's a really nice ball covered in articular cartilage. The one thing, there's a little depression on the head of the, of the femur uh, called the fovea which is actually where the, the ligaments of the femur... Um... Oh, there's one on there. Here we go, that depression there. Um, and that's where uh, the ligament of the femur helps hold 
the joint together. I think we have some nutrient arteries running through there. So that's the, the head of the femur. And then we have the neck of the femur. Now the thing about the neck of the femur is, when somebody talks about a hip fracture, they, they're generally talking of a fractured neck of femur. It's this bit here. A fracture of the pelvis is a pelvic fracture. A fracture of the hip, a fractured hip, is usually a fracture of the neck of the femur here. And because of the big muscles that are attaching around here, this tends to be um, not a good thing and the weight bearing thing of it. So um, fractured neck of femur is, is far more common in the elderly. It happens in young people with like really severe trauma like uh, car crashes and that sort of thing. Um, and the synovial capsule is actually st extending over the neck of the femur, which means that there isn't, I don't think there's a normal periosteum um, and is within the synovial fluid. So in fact, you know, the healing of a fractured neck of femur isn't as great as other regions of the femur. And um, because of that and because of um, the fact that it's more commonplace in older people and in frail people who have bone weakness and bone problems, it's a, it's, a, it's a fracture that has a really high mortality rate associated with it. It's a very dangerous fracture because if you're going to repair it surgically, um, there are risks and dangers in recovering from that surgery. Um, there's a big risk of developing uh, deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolisms as clots form under here and disappear. So it's really not a good thing to break. But the good side is it's a really, really strong bone. So it's not an easy thing to break. And this is one of the reasons why you kind of need to stay strong as you get older. Keep your bones strong and keep your muscles strong. Keep your joints good. Anyway, so the neck of the femur is extending out here. And what it's doing is, is, is it's pushing the femur out laterally, this part of the femur. And it's pushing it out laterally and a little bit anteriorly as well. So the angle created here is called the angle of inclination. So that angle there is the angle of inclination and it can be greater or smaller. It's, it's, it changes as between childhood and adolescence and adults and that sort of thing. That's, if somebody's talking about the angle of inclination of the femur, that's what they're talking about. This angle change between the neck and the diaphysis of the femur down there. All right, so neck of the femur. Um, now we kind of get into the interesting bits, these big lumpy bumpy bits here and here. This large lateral lump is the greater trochanter and this smaller kind of very posterior lump is the lesser trochanter. Now the greater trochanter you can palpate, palpate on yourself, right? Out here, that bony prominence that you're feeling it's the greater trochanter. And look, as you move your femur around, you can feel the greater trochanter move. You can rotate your femur. You can do all sorts of things with your femur and feel your greater trochanter move around. And also you can feel the muscles that are attached to it doing different things depending upon how you're moving your pelvis and your femurs, right? We can see on here as well. Uh, take off gluteus maximus. So that bit you're palpating is here. So there's the greater trochanter there. And we can see all of these muscles running out to attach to it. Um, so we've got, this is gluteus medius and minimus running down to the top of the greater trochanter here. And the bit at the top of the greater trochanter gets called the, the tubercle. Um, and then we've got these smaller muscles running from the pelvis out laterally to the greater trochanter, and those are the lateral rotators of the hip, so the obturator muscles, the gemelli muscles, piriformis, and that sort of thing, right? Um, and then we've got quadratus femoris there, the, like the, quadra the rectangular muscle there. And right, let's have a look on this guy. So we're looking at this from the anterior perspective. Here's the greater trochanter there that you were palpating. There's his tubercle at the top. So that's a big obvious thing. So head, neck, greater trochanter. Now the lesser trochanter, you can just see it. It's very much a posterior thing. So it's, it's poking around back there. Now, greater trochanter up here, we've got gluteus medius and minimus running down from the pelvis here to the greater trochanter, which means when they contract, they do this. 
So they're pulling on the greater trochanter to abduct the femur at the hip joint. Now those other muscles, so the, we've got um, from here, well, from inside the pelvis, they're running around there to the greater trochanter. So when they contract, they pull the greater trochanter that way. So do you see that's a lateral rotation of the femur. Uh, and if this is flexed, then they kind of do anyway. So the purpose of the greater trochanter, the purpose of the neck, these are muscle attachments, and the purpose of the, the, the neck of the femur is to push this muscle, this, this muscle attachment point out away from the pelvis to give a mechanical advantage, to give us bipedal locomotion, all those things we do when we're walking around. So without the neck of the femur doing that, none of this would work. So greater trochanter, uh, abduction from gluteus medius and minimus, and lateral rotation from the, the six lateral rotators uh, around there, right? Now the lesser trochanter, well if we look posteriorly, Something else you might come across is the, is the uh, trochanteric fossa. So there's this fossa in here. And that trochanteric, so you might hear about the lateral rotators or many of them, the gamelli muscles and the obturator muscles uh, inserting there. That's part of the greater trochanter. So it's kind of all the same thing. There's just a little bit of a fossa-y bit there. Now there's the lesser trochanter there. So we're looking at the posterior femur um, and um, the, the lesser trochanter, this is where some of the hip flexors are attached to. So we've got, here's the ilium, we've got iliacus, and we've got psoas major running down from, from here, and they come together to form iliopsoas. So iliopsoas runs over here and inserts into the lesser trochanter. And this is your, 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 your main hip flexor. So when, ili when iliacus and psoas major contract, they pull on the lesser trochanter and they give flexion of the hip. They give flexion of the femur at the hip joint. So that's what the lesser trochanter for. So lesser trochanter is um, iliacus and psoas major, greater trochanter is all those other muscles we were talking about. And that's, that's most of it. That's the really important stuff in the proximal femur. A couple of other footnotes. Not really near the foot, but whatever. Um, intertrochanteric crest and intertrochanteric line. Two other terms you might come across. They're two different things. They're both in between, between the two trochanters. Now, posteriorly, there's the greater trochanter, there's the lesser trochanter, and there's this nice, big, thick, ridgy crest. Posteriorly. So that's the intertrochanteric crest. Anteriorly, it's a bit more feeble. It's feebler. So we have an intertrochanteric line anteriorly. That's what those two things refer to. Uh, we also talk about a quadrate tubercle. So we're talking about uh, quadratus femoris, that, um, that muscle going across here. And quadratus femoris causes another little bump here, which is the quadrate tubercle. And then we're seeing this line running down here, down the diaphysis, which is the linear aspera not in today's business because it's 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 like it's not proximal femur but up here there's a lump posteriorly and that's the gluteal tuberosity for gluteus maximus because gluteus maximus is a powerful um, extensor of the hip joint um, which is what I took off up here isn't it so gluteus maximus actually inserts most of its fibers into the fascia and the connective tissue of the leg but it sends um, a bunch of its fibres into the posterior femur and where it attaches there's a bit of a lump and that's the gluteal tuberosity. Uh, anything else that's really important? That, that, is, that is the nuts and bolts of it. So proximal femur, it's got a head, it's got a neck, it's got a greater trochanter, it's got a lesser trochanter. The greater trochanter, you've got gluteus medius and minimus attached to it for abduction. You've got the lateral rotators attached to it that laterally rotate the femur. Whereas uh, the lesser trochanter, you have the hip flexors, iliopsoas, running over and attaching to that. Um, and that is your proximal femur. All right, okay. Still don't know why, um, when I was so awkward in the exam, maybe I could have rephrased my question a bit differently or something like that. I've got another exam on Monday. That's for the first years, so um, they're busy revising. I hope they do well. Anyway, 
Um, if you want to look at the distal femur, go and have a look at that knee video. We talk about how the distal femur articulates with the tibia and stuff like that. Good luck, crack on, see you next week.